Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 11th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at those same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We used some recent polling results as a takeoff point to ask what a second Dunleavy term would mean. Second, we discussed the next step taken by the federal government last week on Conoco's Willow Project and what that means for Alaska. And third, we use a recent column praising former Governor Walker's leadership to explain that isn't the compliment the author thinks. And now, let's join Michael. Let's dive into the weekly top three. So I li- you literally, we were chatting about this yesterday, uh, getting ready for the show. And um, and uh, all I could think of was this is like the nightmare edition of the weekly top. There were just some things in there. And this was the, the first one, number one, is the one that really caught my attention, which was some of the new polling that is being looked at by the talking heads. Now, nobody really knows because... Rank choice voting and everything else. It's really throwing sick. But the polling that is coming out is, um, well, it's not looking good if you'd like to see change is kind of what I'm coming at. Uh, give me your thoughts on uh, what's happening here for number one of the weekly top three. Well, Ivan Moore from Alaska Research Survey uh, ha- is out with a new poll that um, has a write-up in uh, in the Juno Empire, for those who are interested. Uh, uh, I, the, the best description of it I've found is in the Juno Empire. And it's, a, it's an odd poll. It doesn't seem to really follow ranked choice voting. It looks like it, 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 at least in the governor's race, which I focused on most, it looks like it's the old system of, you know, if everybody just voted once, what would the, uh, what would the outcome be? And, right. and, maybe, and maybe what Ivan's doing is looking at uh, the outcome of the, uh, of the August primary, which is when, when we do only vote once. Uh, but it's a it's an interesting survey. It's got uh, it's got Murkowski ahead, uh, and it's got uh, uh, Begich ahead in the congressional race. But the the one that really grabbed my attention, frankly, was the was the governor's race. And right. here's the here's the summary of it uh, in the Empire article. It says Dunleavy appears to have an easy path to a second term in a three way uh, general election race, and would still prevail if one of his two presumed opponents drops out to avoid a split vote, that's, that's not, that's why I don't think this is really, you know, reflecting ranked choice voting. He is, he Dunleavy is favored by 50.9% with 26.4% of respondents supporting Les Guerra and 22.7% independent former governor, Bill Walker. Um, And when you add those numbers up, they add up to a hundred. So he's, he's somehow, uh, uh, Charlie Pierce and, and Kirka and the other candidates aren't being reflected um, in this poll. Um, but what really struck me, what really, I, it, it, first of all, it struck me that that Dunleavy was was that far ahead. Right. Uh, it's it struck me that Charlie wasn't that Charlie wasn't mentioned in the poll, um, and it struck me that Guerra and uh, and Walker were uh, were so close to each other. Guerra was twenty six point four, and Walker with. Uh, 22.7 but it made me start to think about about if this if this is let's just take for a moment that this is a good uh, estimate of where the election cycle is going 
made me start to think about what the heck is a Dunleavy second term going to look like? <laughs> and the answer is, the answer is, the answer is, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, so, so Jeff Landfield had a piece up in, um, in the Alaska landmine uh, last week that, you know, some will, some will complain about, but I thought was a fairly good analysis of the Dunleavy administration. Dunleavy starts out in 2018 running for governor for a full PFD and payback of, uh, of the, of the uncollected or undistributed portion of the PFD from, uh, from prior years. Um, and that doesn't pan out so well. And so, right. you know, so last year or the year before last, whichever it was the year before last, I guess, um, Dunleavy comes out in favor of a POMB 50, 50 PFD, which is a, which is a, a, a reduction off of, a full statutory PFD and sort of drops the discussion about, uh, about, uh, the payback. Um, and, and, and so, you know, we, in, in one election cycle, in one four year term, we've gone from a full PFD with pay at, payback to a full PFD to a POMV 50, 50 PFD. So what, where does, what, 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 what comfort does that give us when we start thinking about uh, a Dunleavy second term? What what's the guy running on now? Uh, presumably he's running on POMB fifty fifty. Uh, presumably he's running on still uh, on, uh, on on that uh, that proposal, the discount, the PFD discount proposal. But he's still not saying, you know, it, it's how how he's still not explaining how we get there because right. when you look out over the over the ten year term, when you look out over uh, uh, the fiscals over the over the next. 10 years, five years, three years, uh, we go back into deficit, uh, uh, as oil prices, uh, oil prices come down as future oil prices as the futures market selling us oil prices come down. So to get there, to get to even a POMB 50, 50, we have to do one of two things. We have to either cut spending deeply, which he tried, failed in 2019 and hasn't tried again, or we have to have substitute revenues. We have to have alternate, alternate revenues to, uh, to fill the gap, and he's and he's essentially refused to to consider those. So how how do we how do we get there? I mean, there, there's there's no plan that he's outlined that that tells us how we get from point A to point B. He's told us he's told us, I guess, where point B is, but there's no plan that tells us how we get from point from where we are now from point A to 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 point B. Well, this is a so, t that's a typical politician response, isn't it? Here's what I'm going to give you. Never going to tell you how we're going to get there, usually. Nine times out of ten, you never hear exactly how they're going to get there. They just make the promises, and they don't delineate all the steps along the way. Well, it's not only not delineating all the steps. It's not deline delineating any of the steps. And we've got, a, we've got another, you know, we've got a situation where we, we haven't paid back the CDR yet. And when you and when you add in a CBR repayment, uh, which you really should when you look at the long term fiscal outlook, um, it, the situation's even even more challenging. It's even more in need of steps to get to uh, where he's outlined now, where he's going on uh, on POMV fifty fifty. So uh, this poll is is interesting from a lot of perspectives. It's interesting that. It's showing Dunleavy so far ahead of of Walker and Guerra, and when you combine the two, Walker and Guerra combine the two, he's still ahead uh, of their combined vote, less solidly, but, right. but nevertheless still ahead of the combined vote. So it's it's interesting from that st standpoint, but it's interesting, you know, to also confront what the heck this means over the long term. Confront, you know, what a Dunleavy second term right uh, would be. Well, I got to say that, you know, I usually enjoy Ivan Moore's polls. I don't always, you know, I don't agree with him politically or anything, but it's always an interesting insight. But the first thing that I thought of when I read this article in The Empire and took a look at it was that I was concerned about his methodology, specifically on the governor's race. Um, I mean, this is a, you know, it, it's really a four or a five way race, and he focuses only on the top three contenders. And so I, I don't know what questions were asked. I don't know what candidates were offered in the question, but it really starts to make me, you know, ask like, well, what how, did he just throw Charlie and Kirka and the rest of them out? 
um, that Dunleavy, it's a, it's just assumed that he's going to be the single Republican candidate or what. Um, so that, that it really starts to make me question what was the what was the methodology used in here? Because usually, like I said, Ivan's pretty good about this. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't even know how to read this at this point. And I think that's part of the problem with the whole ranked choice thing is that anybody who's done analysis for a long time is still kind of stymied by the potentiality of you know, spoilers and different things happening. I agree. I agree that the methodology is screwy. And, you know, as I say, when you, when you add up all these votes, they add, or we add up all the percentages, they add up to a hundred percent among the three of them. So he's done something odd with, uh, with, with Kirka and, uh, and, uh, and, and Pierce. Uh, but, but, but the numbers are so big for Dunleavy, you at least have to, you, you at least yeah. have to think that directionally it might be going yeah, I would, uh, yeah. in, in the right direction. And, and as I say, that makes me start to think about what, you know, what are we really talking about in terms of a Dunleavy administration? I mean, yeah. well, you and I have talked about this on the show before. It's a very poll driven administration. So maybe the answer is whatever the polls tell you. Over exactly. The next four years. Well, I think that's, that's where you'll go. Another four years of, of, of weak leadership, I think, is what it would be. I mean, I think that would summate the whole thing of inept and weak leadership lacking communication with the people who matter at this point, which would be the public. Um, and, um, I mean, I, I, I would be very frustrated, uh, by that for sure. Uh, especially since I think somebody like Charlie Pierce would make a much better, uh, a much better governor, uh, in the long run. The owner of the most popular restaurant in Delta just put up a big Walker Drygus sign in his highway frontage property yesterday, says the moose is loose. I saw a couple uh, pictures that were shared with me from Fairbanks for some of the local businesses with the same sign, which is a little surprising to me. Um, uh, well, I mean, I guess surprising in one way, but at the same time, not surprising in others, because then you've got, uh, you know, you realize some of the names that are behind some of these businesses, and it really plays right back into what Brad's been talking about, which is the top 20% trying to protect their own. And Bill Walker is the epitome of crony capitalism, uh, you know, protecting the special interests, protecting the government spend for these companies that make big money. Um, one of the businesses I'm thinking of specifically, big money off state contracts. Um, and so not surprising that they would surprise, they would support the Walker Drygus team. Um, I'll be honest with you, Brad, when I read these uh, numbers, um, like you said, <clears throat> seeing that they were evenly split, uh, and even Ivan Moore makes the comment that if one of the two dropped out, if Walker or if uh, Lescara dropped out, Dunleavy would still win based on the numbers that he's showing. And again, questioning his methodology and where are the other candidates and everything else. But I mean, it, uh, that is interesting to see. Now the question is, can Charlie get enough recognition across the state right now to, uh, you know, to make a difference, to, to, to move the needle on that and get him into that top four? Well, I would, you know, Charlie should have a pretty strong vote coming out of the Kenai. He, he ought to have a piece of the, uh, of the Matsu vote. Uh, it's really name recognition and getting around and getting, getting, uh, his name out there. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm just surprised by that Dunleavy number. And I'm surprised, Frank, I guess two things surprised me. One is the, how high the Dunleavy number is and how low the, the, the Walker number is, you know, you would think for, uh, a former governor and uh, you would think for somebody who's, as, as you say, getting, uh, getting the top 20, top 20% support he's getting, you would think those numbers, uh, you would think his number would be higher. I guess I'm a little bit encouraged that his number isn't very high. Um, but Charlie, uh, I think Charlie really needs to, he needs to solidify the keen eye. Um, and he needs to to make inroads in the Matsu. He's got Edie as a lieutenant governor candidate who's up and and seemingly very active up in the Matsu and that and that ought to help. But he needs to be uh, be able to make some uh, inroads uh, into the Matsu, I think, to solidify that number four position. And once he gets the once he gets the number four position, once he's on the on the on the dais as one of those who's running in uh, in the general, uh, I think he'll, uh, I think he'll, uh, move on up, uh, from there. Um, it's going to be a tough race. I mean, Dunleavy's numbers are high, but if you keep asking the question, what are we going to get in a second term? 
but what's the direction of the second term? What's the vision for the second term? What's the what's the purpose of the second term? Why do you want to be governor uh, again uh, after the last four years? Um, if you keep asking that question uh, and and you sort of you're going to get you know the deer in the headlights look. Uh, I I think that's an opening for uh, for Charlie. No, I I would agree, and I I think Charlie's got some groundswell support. I really wish that he had jumped into the race about three months earlier, but he because uh, I think he would have had a little bit more uh, leg in the you know uh, running room in the race. But I think that he is getting some uh, some groundswell support, and I hope that. Uh, uh, I hope that he's successful in in nudging the needle and getting into that. that. That's the key here, right? The key for Charlie is getting into the top four because then he's at least you've got a comparative for Dunleavy, you know, um, and I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping that uh, he's able to to do that. Um, uh, so we'll 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 see what uh, we'll see what happens there. Yeah, you're not you're not on the platform for November if you're not in the top four. So that's it, that's certainly that's certainly a key. And I, and I, you know, I, I'm certain there's going to be common uh, people watching the show who will, who will sort of blow up at this, but I, I just don't see Kirk ever winning the governor's race. No, so, no. So, so if you're in the Matt Sue, I mean, I think that, I think the pitch to the Matt Sue is a practical one, right? Um, do you want Dunleavy or do you want an alternative to Dunleavy uh, right. that can win? And, um, and I, and I think Charlie is, is that I just don't see Christopher, uh, 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 ever getting to a point under rank choice, unranked choice, whatever, uh, ever getting to a point where he could, uh, where he could win the general. Well, and even, uh, uh, and I, I was told privately that even Kirka has said that initially about his run that he, he's really not, you know, he doesn't think he's going to win governor, but he just wants to get the, he wants to be able to, to help fold the narrative and, and craft the narrative of what's going on, uh, which is all well and good. But at some point you got to be like, that's, you know, that's not working. And you're, you're acting as a spoiler for the rest of the race. All right. Well, uh, that's number one. Number two is, uh, is of course, what's going to be happening with Willow, the decision in Willow. So give us a sketch real quick. We'll take about uh, 60, 90 seconds, and then we'll jump into the break and come back. Well, there are two big oil prospects up on the oil developments up on the on the slope that we need to be tracking uh, as we consider uh, where the North Slope oil development is going. One is the Pika Project Oil Searches Pika Project. We've talked a lot about that on the show. The other is the Conoco Willow Project. The Conoco Willow Project is more advanced than Pika in the sense that they've defined the project, they've applied for the permits, the approvals. They got the permits and approvals that they needed during the Trump administration, um, but then the court found those 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 approvals rushed and deficient, uh, and uh, and sent it back. Uh, it's been back before the Bureau of Land Management for a supplemental environmental impact statement. Last Friday, on Friday, the uh, the BLM Bureau of Land Management published the supplemental environmental impact statement, and I think it gives us some hint about where the uh, Willow Project is going. So we're going to talk about that uh, uh, after the break when we come back. Brad Keithley continues with us. It is our weekly top three. We're in number two. We're talking about what are the next steps in the Willow Project, um, which has been touted as a you know, big revenue generator for the state and uh, you know more, more oil in the pipeline, et cetera, et cetera. But what does it really mean? Uh, we're going to talk uh, about that uh, right now. Uh, what, uh, Brad, uh, continue on with the number number two. Well, the BLM, we talked about this on the show a few weeks ago uh, about where Willow was. And, and the BLM, uh, Bureau of Land Management, supplemental EIS, supplemental environmental impact statement, is a critical step uh, in this process. Willow had approval once uh, under the Trump administration. It got tossed by the court. Uh, by the Alaska District Court, rather than appeal it and 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 go up and spend time doing that, both the federal government, both the Biden administration and Conoco decided not to appeal and to work on the supplemental environmental impact statement to try to get back to where the Willow Project was uh, under the Trump administration. This supplemental EIS uh, lays the, the the groundwork or the framework for for where the project goes from here uh, during the during the Biden administration. 
And what we talked about when we talked about this on the show last time was uh, the, the concern that the BLM would approve the project, but approve it with such conditions and restrictions that it would be at the margin uh, of, 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 economic, uh, of, of an economic project for Conoco. And it's not just, does the project make money? It's, it's does the project make money in a way that's competitive with Conoco's other uh, projects? Remember that the Conoco that exists now is different than the Conoco that existed uh, two years ago. Right. Uh, when we were at this process, Conoco is a lot more focused on shale oil uh, these days. It's made major acquisitions in Texas of Texas uh, uh, companies and Texas producing areas, and is really much more a shale company than it than it used to be. And so, when Conoco is looking at its investments, it's comparing uh, investing uh, the the next dollar uh, either in Alaska or. Uh, in shale oil development down uh, down in Texas, and shale has a lot of advantages. It's it's a shorter cycle. You get your money out faster. It's it's less expensive in the sense that you don't have to spend as much money up front to to develop oil. You just it's sort of a manufacturing process. You just go drill the next well and the next well and the next well, as opposed to have to develop all of the infrastructure that you do uh, uh, with an Alaska project. Alaska project is a lot longer term project. So it's the the question is is the is the is the approval that that BLM is likely to give or will give the Willow project is that going to make for an economic project an economically attractive project uh for Conoco. And and the answer is we don't know yet. Uh what BLM did on Friday was outline five alternatives Without yet picking the alternative, with the with the conditions that uh, that they will that they will approve. These five are now open for public comment again over the next forty five day period. That may be exp- extended a little bit, but are now open for public comment before the before the BLM makes a, makes its final decision on what what form of project it's approved for Conoco. The five uh, options ranged from. Full approval for everything Conoco asked for, uh, the 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 big project that it asked for, to no approval of anything, uh, the no action uh, option, um, and and then the the other uh, three were were sort of uh, at various ranges between between those two. The the new one that that the BLM outlined was a significantly cut back. Uh, project the new the new option that BLM outlined was a significantly reduced uh, footprint for the project. It didn't approve all of the pads, uh, drilling pads that Conoco had asked for and that were approved in the original uh, Trump administration approval, um, and restricted restricts the footprint uh, 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 quite a bit, as uh, as it was described in the Anchorage Daily News article, which is a good summary uh, of it. Uh, BLM uh, highlighted one new development alternative in the draft environmental review that it said would reduce Willow's potential footprint. The proposal would remove two of the five proposed drill sites from consideration, including eliminating the northernmost proposed drill site and associated infrastructure uh, in in a special area that's inside uh, 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 NPRA. BLM expects uh, expects that under this alternative, ConocoPhillips would need to give up significant lease rights it acquired in the special area. The proposal includes a possible fourth drill site uh, out of the out of the five, a possible fourth, but approval of that would require an additional environmental review process under federal law. Of uh, the statement said, so I, I what what the what the Biden administration is trying to do is is find a middle ground for them politically, a middle ground for them that's between the no action that the environmental community wants and is pushing and is screaming about. And the and the full five, the 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 big Conoco, the, the the full Conoco project that was approved under Trump, and that you know Senator Murkowski and Senator Sullivan and others are pushing the administration to approve. They're trying to find a middle ground between those. Two. And the question is going to be whether the middle ground they ultimately come to, uh, as I say, is going to be economically attractive for uh, Conoco. What what the environmental community would hope is if if the Biden administration is going to approve anything. It's going to be something that that Biden administration can claim they approve, 
but Conoco finds less economically attractive uh, than uh, than its alternate developments. Right. So, I mean, they've got to look at it in its totality. How might we, you know, to maximize the profits, to maximize what we need to do to make it economically feasible, we need the five different drilling sites. But now that they've reduced it down to four or three, then now is it really even feasible to kick off the whole thing at all? I mean, you know. And, and again, you you hit the nail on the head. This is Biden seeking that political middle. This is about politics. This is not about energy. This is not about sustainability. This is not even about environmentalism. This is about politics. Oh, it is. Absolutely. I mean, and, and what's driving it, what's driving it is the desire to approve something which which helps uh, uh, which helps support Senator Murkowski because Senator Murkowski can then say, look, there's a benefit to me. You know, working with the Biden administration on certain issues, uh, the Biden administration works with us uh, on uh, on other issues. Right. And the Biden administration wants to achieve that, but the Biden administration doesn't want to go so far that they that they lose the environmental community uh, on the other side. So it's a it, it it's it's an interesting process to watch. They've got this middle what they what what some are going to say uh, is this middle ground outlined there. Uh, we've got the 45-day comment process, and then BLM takes all those comments into consideration and uh, and makes its uh, its final decision. We aren't there yet uh, in in terms of the final decision. You know, if the Biden administration is really politically uh, 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 attuned over this, if they're really driving at it, what they may do is come out with a decision before the election, so that so that it supports Murkowski. But with a decision that Conoco can't turn around fast enough in terms of in terms of their decision on the economics, uh, and we don't find out whether it's a real project, whether it's a whether whether what they approved was enough to get Conoco to go forward until after the election. So it's a it's a process that uh, that's still playing out, but a very important process from the standpoint of Alaska in terms of uh, in terms of oil production on the slope and to some degree. Uh, revenues. Willow is less important than Pika from a revenue standpoint because Willow's on federal lands, and so the royalty goes in accordance with federal law. Very little of it to the state. Um, we get production tax off of the production, but we don't get the royalty. Pika will get both royalty uh, and production tax. So, from a revenue standpoint, Pika is more important. But from a production standpoint, you know, keeping the pipeline operating and all that sort of stuff. And to some degree, from a revenue standpoint, Willow uh, Willow is important as well. Number three, the weekly top three, down to about four minutes here. Um, I tried not to gag as I got past the headline. In turbulent times, Alaska needs a leader as governor. An opinion piece in the ADN from Al Bolia uh, talking about how Bill Walker is the only choice of any blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Brad. Tell me your thoughts. <laughs> Well, Al Belay is a guy I respect. Al Belay uh, uh, used to head the pipeline operations for BP Alaska. He uh, he's a consultant and uh, and a lecturer and a, and a professor on leaders on the issue of leadership and how you uh, identify leaders and how you develop leaders and somebody who whose uh, readings and or whose writings and and uh, and discussions I've followed for a long time and, and have a lot of respect for. Um, except in this case. Uh, so Al, Al writes his column in the ADN and the ADN op-ed uh, about uh, about leadership and, you know, and analyzes leaders and analyzes Walker in terms of leadership and finds him the leader that Alaska needs, as you say, and as the headline says, uh, for tur- turbulent times. But but this is this is sort of classic, right? He's leading us where? <laughs> I mean, it's it's not just is is anyone a leader it's the question of where he's leading us, where he proposes to lead us to. The thing that Walker has not addressed that I've seen, and I've tried to follow closely, the thing that Walker's not addressed, uh, uh, at least to my satisfaction uh, in, in, in any part, is, is what his answer is for fiscal policy going forward from the revenue side. I mean, I, I, he's, he's coming out with all these criticisms of Dunleavy and Dunleavy's vetoes, <laughs> you know, the bare minimum of vetoes that we had in this budget. He's coming out with all these criticisms of Dunleavy and and Dunleavy's spending policies and, you know, where Walker would spend that Dunleavy didn't and right, right. policies Walker would. But how's he going to pay for it? Um, well, you know, we, know, is, we know how he's going to pay for it. He's well, going to take but, the but entire he, permanent fund. That's how he's going to pay for it. 
But he doesn't say that. He doesn't say he tries very carefully to avoid that. And in doing so, he avoids saying anything. So, you know, from the standpoint of a leader, you want a leader to outline his vision, outline the full vision, not just the partial vision, not just the I'm going to spend here and spend there and spend there. You, you, you want, you want to, I mean, fiscal policy is two parts. Fiscal policy is where are you going to, how are you, how are you going to spend it? What are you going to spend it on? But the second and equal part is how are you going to raise the revenues to, to, to support all that spending? And Walker, Walker is studiously avoiding the second. So I've got to, I've got to disagree with, uh, with, with Al on his assessment of Walker uh, in this regard. I mean, a leader would tell you, the, the both the good and the bad. He's gonna. He would tell you where, where from a fiscal policy standpoint, where am I going to spend? What am I going to support? What are my pol- spending policies going to be? But equally, he would say, how am I going to raise the revenues? Who's it going to affect? Why is my revenue proposals better than anybody else's revenue proposals? How does it affect the Alaska economy? How does the how do the re- those revenue policies affect uh, Alaska families? And, and Walker's just entirely uh, in, in, right, as I say. When he's hi- when he's highlighting a rate on the permanent fund as creating a more stable permanent fund, that's part of the problem right there. That's not leadership, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know Al Balea from a hole in the ground, but uh, with all due respect to him, this is one of the craziest things that I've ever uh, that I've ever seen. Again, highlighting and touting the fact that he rated that was one of the things that he says here. First and foremost, Bill Walker is courageous. He does not shy away from challenges, and he confronts issues head on. From policies making the budget and the permanent fund sustainable to expanding Medicaid to provide tens of thousands of people with health care. Yeah, who's, where, how's it being paid for? Oh, the one is being paid for by the other. I see. We're going to continue. And all these pie-in-the-sky ideas all being made possible by taking from the permanent fund. I mean, it's just it's insane. Yeah, it's it's courageous. I mean, essentially, the, the the extrapolation of that is it's courageous to take money from middle and lower income Alaska families and let the top twenty percent Al's well in the top twenty percent let the top twenty percent uh, escape uh, any responsibility for uh, for those for those spending policies. Yeah, that's not that's not courage. But but Walker's just Walker's trying to play in in some sense trying to play like the like his first administration didn't happen, right? Right. It's, well, it's, he wants actually he wants to have it both ways. I'm a proven leader who's done the job, but don't pay attention to anything that I did back then. <laughs> I mean, you know, right? I mean, that's what he wants. He wants both he wants to cut both ways. Yeah, and we're beginning to see, I mean, Al's is uh, is one of several uh, Adam Wool did an op-ed it was in the news finder. It may have been elsewhere uh, in support of Walker. I mean, Walker's got this support group that's starting to roll out uh, these these op eds about how great Walker is and how great the administration was, um, and and how he's great. But but it's all it's all the the top twenty percent spend, but don't make me pay for any of it. Uh, uh, crowd. I mean, Adam was. In the legislature, proposed cutting the PFD down to down to a ten percent ten percent of right. the POMV, right? Um, and and you know, and Al is is doing what he's doing. It's you, you've got to you've got to look under the hood and see you know the motivations of of the people that are supporting Walker, and it's the and it's the same old crowd going down the same old direction. So. You know, we started we started this today's segment by complaining about Dunleavy, and and where would Dunleavy's uh, uh, second term go? You know, what, what's what's the goal of the second term? Why are you running for governor? We sort of know what walk why Walker's running for governor. Uh, he sort of answered that question, but it's the wrong answer. So it's um we're we're not we're not making much progress in terms of uh, in terms of the candidates, uh, uh, the candidates that we've talked about leading uh, leading us forward to a better day ahead. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's definitely like I said, the nightmare edition, the weekly top three: <laughs> Dunleavy, Walker. I mean, you know, the whole thing. I mean, it's it's uh, it's a we we really. I mean, my personal opinion is I I we I've got to do everything possible to get Charlie at least enough name recognition to be into that top four, so there can be a real discussion and a real debate, and there could be a counterpoint to Dunleavy. That people who are dissatisfied with him can at least have another choice. Uh, Charlie came. Ballot. Charlie came out with a good op-ed uh, over the weekend. I think it was over the weekend. Um, 
you know, I saw it in the peninsula. Maybe it was in, uh, maybe it was in other newspapers as well. He was talking about K through 12 education policy and really hitting hard on administrative costs, doing some analysis of, of how much of Alaska K through 12 spending goes toward administration versus the lower 48 and focusing on the fact that, that we're administration heavy uh, up here. We don't put as much uh, as a percent into the classroom. So Charlie's starting to get out there uh, with, uh, with some analysis and some, uh, some discussion of uh, fiscal issues that, uh, that at least thus far looks, uh, looks fairly promising. Yeah, no, well, we'll, uh, we'll have to see, uh, we'll have to see how things go out. Uh, I mean, here we are, we're uh, 34 days away from, uh, from the primary and uh, we'll see we'll see what comes of this very interesting a poll for the legislature and a primary for the rest of everybody else pretty much at this point. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll see how it all goes out. Uh, Brad, final thoughts here before we let you go this morning. Anything else uh, on your mind or things you're looking at, et cetera? Well, I I uh, I, I keep following. I mean, Willow's important. Uh, I keep following Pika. What we're waiting for on the Pika project is financing. Uh, I mean, oil search is continuing to, you know, make plans around how they would develop, but they don't have the money. They don't, uh, Santos hasn't made the commitment, the financial commitment to, uh, to bring that project, uh, forward. They keep talking about trying to find other investors in it. Uh, there's been no unba- announcements of other investors. I mean, I, occasionally you see an article in the Australian press, Santos is Australian based. Occasionally you see an article in this, in the Australian press about, uh, about Amer- various companies looking at uh, co-investing with uh, w- in the Pika development, but we haven't seen anything concrete about it. So I keep I keep following every place I can to see if I can pick up hints of uh, people actually getting serious about putting money into Pika. We need that. Right, it's a big project for us. So that's that's basically the uh, the other thing that I keep uh, keep reading the daily press on. Well, we'll keep our ears to the ground and our eyes open, and uh, and like I said, we'll start pulling. Uh, uh, we'll start pulling even harder for uh, for Charlie to at least get into the top four, so that we can have another option when it comes time to election day, and we're not just stuck with the three that we. I mean, again, this whole Ivan Moore poll just kind of you know uh, uh, where were where were the other ones, or they, were they just it didn't even matter at that point? I guess is the question. So we'll uh, we'll have to see. Um, well, I appreciate you coming on board and joining with us, uh, 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 Brad. Uh, we look forward to talking with you next week, okay? Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap on another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.